Hello students, this is Mrs. Wismer, and it's slowly dawning on me that in our Thursday class, I am not going to be able to cover everything that I would want to, to the degree that I would want to. And so I'm going to post every now and then a video that I hope will help you review things that perhaps are familiar to you, but you don't have them down quite yet. You aren't totally clear about everything. And one of those things I'd like to talk about today is the parts of speech. Now, some of you have taken Shirley Grammer, some of you Bob Jones, Abeka, Rod and Staff, Jansen. There are a number of programs out there. And probably you are familiar with the eight parts of speech. <clears throat> but I would like to go over these with you and uh, just to be sure that you understand them and put something here that you can refer to every now and then if you have a question. So let's just dive right in. A noun, it's the most common type of word that we use. And it is a word used to name a person, place, thing, or idea. And of course, there are several kinds of nouns. There is a proper noun, which names a particular place, thing, person, and it is always capitalized. For example, you will always capitalize someone's name, like Anne, or the name of a state, New Mexico, or the name of a place, such as the Willis Tower in Chicago. Ah, there's another one, Chicago. You would capitalize that as well. <clears throat> There's also the common noun. A common noun does not name a particular place, person, or thing, and it is not necessarily or ever capitalized. Common nouns would be something like woman, state, building, and of course those refer back to the Willis Tower, New Mexico, and Anne. If you're just going to talk about a woman without a name, you do not capitalize it. The same thing with the state and with the building. Then there are such things as an abstract noun. Abstract noun and abstract noun names a quality, a characteristic, or an idea. <clears throat> One of those might be peace. Ambition, if you remember reading the Laura Ingalls stories, she had to write an essay on the word ambition. If you don't remember that, Go check your Laura Ingalls books and find that little essay. You'll find it very helpful. She did a good job. The word loyalty. What makes these words abstract is that they cannot be sensed with any of your senses. You can't taste peace. You can't smell ambition. You can't hear loyalty. These are things that do not come to us through our senses. They are things that are understood, and that's why they are called abstract. Then there are concrete nouns. <clears throat> Those are nouns that name an object, and they can be perceived by the senses. You can see a star. You can hear a whisper. You can taste cinnamon. All four of my children love cinnamon. I don't know where they got that, but they do. That's a concrete thing that you can taste, and they enjoy it. There are also collective nouns. A collective noun is a word that names a group, a jury. You might have a jury of 12 people. You call it a jury, but it's made up of many different people, a band, or a family. A family isn't one person. It's at least two or more, <clears throat> the way that we use that word in English. Then there are compound nouns. That's a noun that's composed of more than one word. Here's a long one. County Savings and Loan Association. That whole thing would be considered a compound noun. Or how about this, a roller coaster. Two words, but it is one thing, thus a compound noun. Weekend, those two words go together to form a compound noun. And here's one that's hyphenated, forget me not. And I'm sure you can think of many other compound nouns if you would stop to do that. Now we've talked about nouns. Let's talk a little bit about pronouns. We've all heard that a pronoun takes the place of a noun or of more than one noun. 
<clears throat> Every pronoun needs an antecedent, which is the word to which a pronoun refers. One of the film projectors is broken. It has been sent out for repair. The antecedent to it is the word one. That's correct. If you're with me, you understand that. If you start using pronouns, but you have used no antecedents, people sometimes have a hard time to know what you're thinking about, what you're talking about. So if you can, try to use an antecedent. It, in this case, replaces the word one. Now, there are seven classes of pronouns. You may or may not have known that. This could get confusing, but stick with me. There are the personal pronouns, I, you, we, they, etc. And there are possessive forms of personal pronouns, my house, your house, his house, ours, etc. Then you have the reflexive and intensive pronouns. Both the reflexive and intensive use the same form, myself, yourself, ourselves, etc. But this is how they are used. If it's reflexive, you would write something like this. Miranda explained herself. Herself refers back to Miranda. It reflexes. So it is reflexive. I should say it reflects. So it is reflexive of Miranda. If you're going to use the intensive pronoun, you would say Miranda herself made the explanation. And of course, what do you mean? You mean no one else. Miranda herself made the explanation. Then you're being intense. It's like you're underscoring something. Next, there are relative pronouns, which are who, which, whose, whom, and that. There are interrogative pronouns. That's a big word, interrogative. Well, to remember that word, I always think of a courtroom. What happens in a courtroom? That's right. A witness is interrogated. And if you are interrogated, you are asked lots of questions. So interrogative, that word is a little long perhaps, but it need not be confusing. Just think of interrogation, which leads to asking questions. And if you're going to ask questions, you usually start them with a pronoun. Who did this? Which of those is yours? Whose idea was that? With whom did you go to the movie? Or what do you think you're doing? All of those are questions that begin with interrogative pronouns. There are demonstrative pronouns. This, these, that, and those. And you can just tell by these that they set something apart from everything else. It's not that, it's this. It's not those over there, it's these right here. So a demonstrative pronoun simply selects. It's a very selective pronoun. Then there is the indefinite list of pronouns, and there are many of them, and we use these all the time. And when we use the indefinite pronouns, in this case, we usually don't. This would be the exception to having an antecedent. We don't have an antecedent usually when we use these. Someone broke into the house. Well, we don't know who that someone is. It's an indefinite pronoun. All of these are indefinite. <clears throat> so you may want to just look them over when you have some time. Moving right along to the next very widely used type of word, and that is a verb. A word that expresses action or otherwise helps to make a statement. Of the action verbs, there are two kinds, the transitive and the intransitive. A transitive verb is a verb that transfers action to an object or a person. We would say the rain lashed the windows. The windows are receiving the action of the rain lashing, okay? The rain lashed the windows. That is going to be a transitive verb. If we speak of an intransitive verb, we would just say something like, my puppy sneezed. That's it. The puppy sneezed. Nothing receives the action. Now, the puppy performs the action, 
but nothing receives it. So it is an intransitive verb. Then we have linking verbs, and uh, probably the most commonly used linking verb comes from to be, and to be is a very irregular verb. We often don't think of the words I am coming from the verb to be, but they are. I am, you are, he, she, or it is, they are, we are, those are all part of the verb to be. Then there's the linking verb uh, that t kind of takes the place of to be, and I'll give you an example of that in a second. Let's go back to the verb to be. Jane was exhausted. Past tense of is, is, was. A linking verb. Exhausted is what Jane was. Jane was exhausted. Jane and exhausted, in this case, are considered equal. Now, there are other verbs that are kind of like to be. They would be something like appear or feel. Kevin appeared relaxed. Could we say Kevin was relaxed? Yes, we could. But if we use the word appeared, it draws a stronger image in our mind of how to picture Kevin. And once again, relaxed and Kevin would be equal. In general, a verb is a linking verb if you can substitute some form of the verb seem. If you can put seem in the place of whatever linking verb you're trying out, then it probably is a linking verb. Let's move on to adjectives. An adjective describes a noun or a pronoun telling a number of things. It answers what kind, which one, and how many? Well, if you're going to say what kind, you would say a green apple, a small car, a capable student. Those are all pronouns. But an adjective can also tell you which one. This woman, that play, these peaches over here are on sale. An adjective can also answer how many. Some birds, two squirrels, etc. You could probably come up with many of those by yourself. Then an adverb describes a verb, an adjective, or another adverb. <clears throat> it answers questions like how, when, where, to what extent, how often. Well, she reads quickly. It tells you how she reads. She reads early in the morning. That tells you when. She reads everywhere. Answers the where question. To what extent? She reads thoroughly. No skimming a book for her. How often? She reads frequently. So an adverb will answer all of those questions. Now, another part of speech is the preposition. Preposition is a word used to show the relation of a noun or pronoun to some other word in the sentence. So let's look at a sentence that has a preposition in it. The first speaker on the program is my mother. Okay, on the program is a prepositional phrase because on is a preposition. And program is the noun in this case. It could be a pronoun if you had another word there that is being related to the word speaker. Where is the speaker? The speaker is on the program. The first speaker on the program is my mother. On is the preposition and program is telling you about the speaker. Let's look at another one. My daughter will teach in Aurora, Illinois this year. Now this time we're not talking about the daughter, we're talking about where she will teach. Again, in is your preposition. Aurora, Illinois is not describing the daughter, it's describing the verb, will teach. So sometimes a prepositional phrase will describe a noun or a subject, and sometimes it'll describe to you something about the verb and the context will tell you the difference. A preposition must have an object of the preposition. If it does not have an object, and up above the objects would be program and Aurora, Illinois, if it doesn't have an object, it is not a preposition. It's something else. So let's look at this particular sentence and compare it to another. He tripped over the chair. Okay, we've got over, preposition, chair, object of the preposition, that's a preposition and a prepositional phrase. Over 
is a preposition. What if we said the chair tipped over? Is an over a preposition? It is a preposition. But in this sentence, it's not a preposition because it doesn't have an object of the preposition. In this case, it is an adverb. Over is an adverb telling how the chair tipped. The chair tipped over. So be sure that you do not confuse a prepositional phrase with an adverb. Let's move on. Another part of speech is the conjunction, a word that joins words or groups of words. Con, C-O-N, means with or together. And junction is a place where things come together. If you're ever driving down the highway, sometimes it'll tell you this next corner will be a junction, a coming together of two different highways. There are three kinds of conjunctions, coordinating conjunctions, and these conjunctions coordinate or bring together clauses that are of equal value. And the little words that bring these clauses together, if you want to remember them, they actually spell the word fanboys. For and nor, but or yet and so. And so if you're trying to remember what are those coordinating conjunctions, just take and make the word fanboys and think of three letter words or a couple of two letter words that would coordinate two different clauses. And there you will have it. There are also correlative conjunctions. These conjunctions are always used in pairs. That's why they correlate, either or, neither nor, both and, not only, but also. And finally, whether or. These shirts are available not only in small sizes, but also in out sizes. Out sizes simply means very large sizes. The speech was neither eloquent nor convincing. There you have the neither nor. Jim was both elated and exhausted upon reaching the summit. Of course, he got to the top of the mountain and the view was gorgeous, so he was elated but his body was exhausted from the climb. Kate wondered whether Sue played saxophone or flute. There is a whether or. Those all are called correlative. Then there are subordinating conjunctions. This is where you have an independent clause, which is just a sentence that can stand by itself, and another clause that can't stand by itself and helps to support the first one. Thus, a subordinating, it comes under the main clause. <clears throat> a lot of these you are already familiar with because we talked about the www.asia.buw. All of these words, when, while, where, as, since, if, although, because, unless, whereas, are wonderful starters to adverbial clauses. But there are more. And I know you're familiar with these, but I'll just remind you. After, as much of, before, as much as, before, how, in as much as, that sounds like lawyer talk, in order that, provided, than, though, and until. All of these words could begin a clause that would be subordinate. Finally, let's talk about the interjection. This is a word that expresses emotion and has no grammatical relation to other words in the sentence. And most of these you're very familiar with. We use them all the time. We say, oh, or my goodness, or ah, or ouch. And finally, wow. So an interjection, you just throw it in. Doesn't have to be connected to anything. It can be a good attention getter and a good way to express yourself. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed a look at the eight parts of speech. And um, I hope that you'll review this from time to time so that you can look at a sentence and tell all of its parts uh, without too much trouble. <laughs>